I'm Rip Esselstyn, and you're listening to the Plan Strong Podcast. What's the single biggest way that we can reduce our impact on the Earth's resources? We're going to find out today with lifestyle medicine practitioner, registered dietitian, and longtime environmental activist, Dr. Peter Johnston, right after this message from Plant Strong. I want to tell you something, and that is operating a food company has been one of the most challenging endeavors of my life. From innovating products that we want to land at the intersection of taste and nutrition, to wrestling with supply chain issues and managing inventory, I have had more sleepless nights in the past three years than I have in the last 30, including the 12 when I was a firefighter. But no one tells you that food is hard. But I also want to say, it's because of each of you that we continue to get in the trenches day after day after day. It's in our core values to keep at it, knowing that we are filling a giant void in the market with products that you can't find anywhere else. And this makes it easier for us to climb out of bed each day. I want to thank you for your patience. We are anxiously awaiting the return of our organic pancake and waffle mixes. And we're excited to announce that our Plant Strong milks will be available online later this week, followed soon thereafter by the return of our exciting new burger mixes. Our goal is to be your reliable and trustworthy partner for all things Plant Strong allowing you to stock up on healthy meals that you can make and enjoy in minutes while still managing your busy lives. I appreciate each and every one of you and want you to know that the effort will be worth it once more brands start to care about the integrity of the nutrition that they're putting into their products. Thank you so much for your support and please stay tuned for exciting updates at planstrong.com. Several months ago, I received an email from my guest today, Dr. Peter Johnston. Peter's a native New Zealander that's now living and practicing in Australia, and he's a registered dietitian with a master's in nutrition and dietetics and a PhD in human genetics. He's also a fellow of the Austral-Asian Society of Lifestyle Medicine. In his email to me, He shared a very powerful PowerPoint presentation about the impact of food systems and the environment and invited me to use this information from his research any way that I saw fit. I can't think of a better way to celebrate Earth Day than by having Peter on the podcast this week to talk about his work and share solutions for our climate, soil, animals, and the health crisis that is afoot. Here's the thing. We can't feed the whole world today on a Western-style diet. We, We all are aware of this. There just isn't enough land or resources. And it's going to be even more impossible with the forecast of 10 billion people by mid-century. And Dr. Johnston proposes a solution for each of us and ways that we can cast a vote for the kind of world that we want. And yes, it can be as simple and powerful as avoiding meat and dairy products and eating more plants. Please welcome to the Plant Strong Podcast, Dr. Peter Johnston. All right, Peter Johnston, all the way from Australia. Welcome to the Plant Strong Podcast. Thank you, Rip. It's a pleasure and honor to meet you. I'm excited to be here. Yeah. How are you doing, mate? It's early in the morning, but I've had it's, I'm caffeinated, so I'm happy and well at 6 a.m. here. So and still dark. Hmm. But midsummer. Well, so what what exactly is the time there? Here it's in Austin, Texas. It's 103 in the afternoon. You were about 16 hours ahead of you, so I can tell you what's going to happen in the future. 
<laughs> that's pretty trick. It's that's six a.m. Yeah, Wednesday morning. Well, so Peter, you have you have a real passion for all things plants and trying to get the world, for the most part, uh, to eradicate itself from animal agriculture, which you've done a lot of research on and, and proves to be very, very inefficient and costly to both our human health and to the planetary health. And I want to dive into that uh, in, in great detail. But before we do, I'd love to learn a little bit more about you. So tell me, you're, you're in Australia. You, were you born and raised in Australia? No, I'm a Kiwi. I'm from New Zealand. Is it, seriously? So, wow. Yeah, so I grew up in beautiful New Zealand, the land of a long white cloud, as it's called, it's called by the Maori, the native people there. Or well, sometimes they called it the land of the wrong white crowd. Okay. <laughs> um, I came to Australia in 87 to do my PhD here in human genetics. <clears throat> Got it, in human genetics. Okay. And along that way, you, uh, you, you've done a lot of other things. I mean, so what along your path led you to decide that you wanted to, you know, do get a PhD, human genetics? And I think before we started rolling here, you, you mentioned that you also got a PhD in aging and like, uh, from uh, somewhere in, in uh, Montreal, if I'm not mistaken. I uh, know I did my PhD in Canberra here at the National University in uh, human genetics to study aging. And that took me to Montreal to do a postdoc, but that didn't go very well um, for multiple reasons, the bully boss, uh, lack of genetic engineering equipment. So I left academia and left that job and never came back. Um, I did a range of other things, including about a decade as a pretty much full-time political activist, fighting for social justice causes in New Zealand, Australia, and the US, and um, then retrained as a dietitian. So I came back here and did a master's in nutrition and dietetics mm. in the mid-90s. What, what kind of social justice causes were you, uh, were you fighting for? Environment. Um, Feminism, anti-uranium mining, racial justice, uh, um, free education, anti-capitalist stuff, pretty much the whole kit and caboodle um, for more social justice. So that was a tremendous education. I had pretty much seven years doing that full time and we read and studied voraciously the whole time. So wow. world history, politics, economics, theory, you know, uh, we produced our own newspaper and distributed that. So that was interesting, and it wasn't wasn't the smartest career move, but um, it was a hell of an education around how the world works and how power works. I I I, I would imagine so. And it's probably one of the things that has forged you into who you are today. It has. Yeah, it gave me, I developed a really strong sense of social justice and I was already a vegan then. Um, and But the, the others in the organisations with me weren't interested in that at all, uh, mm. despite me raising it. So that was a, a frustration. They didn't see it as important or relevant. Isn't, um, that, isn't that something to me, it's kind of bewildering to me that you're, we're working with a bunch of people that are really passionate about social mm. justice, mm. and yet they can't, they can't see something what to you and I, and I think all of our listeners see is so blatantly obvious is the social injustices around our food system, our current food system, mm. and what it is doing to humanity, the planet, all that stuff. Of course. How it's speciesism, how... You know, I think there's a lot of violence involved in the way we produce and exploit animals. And I think we'd have a much more gentle, peaceable population if we didn't treat animals like that. And we recognise them as fellow sentient beings. And also, they were environmentalists, but they were blind to the environmental destruction of animal agriculture. Mm. So, mm. very smart, good people. Lots of amazing people I met in those years, but just the blinkered. Cognitive dissonance, maybe they like the meat. 
their eggs, the dairy, et cetera? Yeah. No, I think cognitive dissonance is, is the perfect term for that. Mm. So you mentioned before we jumped on here that you did uh, for several years, you were doing something with sheep. What, was, what exactly was it you did, <laughs> you did with, 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 with sheep that we should know about? Oh, you have to be careful how you phrase that in New Zealand. No. <laughs> it used to be. Like I think anywhere, anywhere, not just New Zealand. <laughs> right. New Zealand used to have about three times more sheep than it had people. Oh. And they they, uh, they joked that it was the land where men were men and sheep were nervous. Um, <laughs> oh, so that's I, awesome, Peter. Oh, um, my God. <laughs> anyway, this is probably a family show, so I shouldn't go any further, but. I worked yeah. in shearing gangs as a young man during my summer holidays. So no, wait, then, hold on for a sec. A shearing gang. What does that mean exactly? All oh, right, this doesn't translate. Um, when New Zealand produced a lot of wool and sheep's meat, so the wool was a big valuable product. So it needed the sheep needed to be shorn once a year, so spring and summer. And so they had specialized professional shearers with support staff who'd pick up the fleece and get the sheep out of the pens and people like me i did the pressing of the wool bales so that it was a team of people we had a team of seven usually with one cook and we would travel around from farm to farm work seven days a week 5 a.m to 5 p.m until the flock was shorn and so long days very physical work um, very hot and sweaty in these hot sheds with just a tin roof no insulation and we would, I did this for three summers, all summer. It was good pay for a young guy. Um, but seven of us plus the cook would eat a sheep a day because it was such so, physical work. And so, and, so, and so when you say you'd eat a sheep a day, so you'd be, give me an example. From 5 a.m. to 5 p.m., how many sheep could you shear? Are we talking like 250 or are we talking 500 or are we talking 50? Lambs were quicker because they're smaller, but from memory, the top shearers would shear about 400 sheep a day. And there'd be usually three shearers, three rouseabouts, who were the ones who swept away the droppings and picked up the fleece and brought it to the presser, which was me. Um, okay. Okay. <laughs> and so, and then what? At some point in the day, would would you guys kill one of the sheep to eat or was there a cook and that was his job? How did that work? We had a cook and it was always a female, but just sign of the times, I guess. Um, the farmer would have a sheep or two hanging in the shed for about a week, getting a bit more ripe. So it was tender. And I, my job as the presser was to cut off the, the manky bits where there are flies at it and butcher that animal. It was already skinned and gutted. So I would have to cut it into pieces and bring it up for the cook. And then we'd have a cooked, we'd start at five, we'd have a cooked full meal, 7 a.m. midday, and after we'd showered at finish of day at five, after 5 p.m. So that cooked meal would be huge amounts of sheep meat, potatoes and vegetables. And, and is, is, can you remember in those, over the course of those three summers, did you get absolutely sick and tired of sheep meat or, or not? Oh, no, I was, it was such physical work and I was, you, you know, that age, I was yeah, always hungry. So the, the joke, the boss even joked he was going to have to cut my pay because I ate so much. <laughs> <laughs> and you, so it was really and what, physical work. And you were probably, what, six feet, 130? <laughs> no, I've always been skinny, but I was around six foot then, yeah. Okay. So okay. it was really hard work. So you were really hungry when the food came out and we had yeah. two cooked morning morning tea and afternoon tea, each, you know, scones, biscuits, cakes. We had an enormous amount of food. And so did, so did that experience, did that affect your, um, your move to go and become plant-based? No, not a bit, actually. It wasn't until I met a, a vegetarian girlfriend at university, um, when was that about 1980, 81? And she was the first person I'd ever met who didn't eat meat or uh -huh. fish. And I thought it was pretty weird, but she was really nice. And we went, we lived together for three years. Um, and 
pretty quickly I picked up the habit and decided I couldn't eat meat anymore. I literally gagged on a ham roll at university yeah. and said, I'm done. I'm not eating meat or fish again. And I had knew nothing about the environment, nothing about health, nothing about ethics. I just didn't like it anymore. Huh. And, and I yeah. began to learn after that about the impacts. But we'd, we'd arranged to not eat meat at home to make it easier when we were living together. And we were living with my sister and her boyfriend. Four of us, you know, share accommodation. It was cheap for students. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I was still having meat outdoor, outside of the house. But once I gagged on this ham roll, that was the end. That was um, 81. I became vegetarian. 81. And then you went, you went fully plant-based in 91. Is that right? Yeah, correct. Yeah, after reading John Robbins' seminal work, Diet for a New America. Oh, yeah. yeah. In Montreal. You were, good for you for, for, for being curious and reading John's book. Um, yeah, that, that book really swayed a lot of people. Uh, oh, yeah. To go, yeah. to go, to go plant-based. Yeah, there's a whole generation of John Robbins vegans around the world. I've yeah. met one at my yoga studio here. We're good friends now. She became vegan around the same time. Same, same reason. Wow. Fantastic. Uh, so I'd love to know a little bit about, you've got a whole bunch of degrees. Will you share with everybody the degrees that you have be before I start peppering you with questions on food and the environment and, um, and all kinds of good stuff? Well, I don't want to sound like I'm boasting. I was just, I was more, yeah. I was trying to avoid getting a real job. And in those days you got paid to go to university. So <laughs> it was, <laughs> it was easy to stay on and study. But um, I started with a bachelor's in psychology because I didn't know what to do. I'd um, worked a little bit after school and having a failed attempt at being a trainee teacher. I didn't like that. So I did a psych degree with politics and philosophy, but towards the end of it, I realized for some reason, I got obsessed about not aging and terrified of dying. So <clears throat> finished that degree and right off the back of that went straight into a, a science degree with as much genetics and biochemistry as I could get. And um, and so I did a BSc honours degree in, in um, zoology, which is where all the genetics and physiology and biochem was in those days. Yeah. And then got a scholarship to Australia, came here in 87 and did my doctorate, the PhD in human genetics. So we were cloning and sequencing and splicing DNA. And that was really giving me the tools and the skills to pursue research into causes of aging. Because I was obsessed with not getting old or not having my parents die on me. Mm -hmm. And I wanted them to be able to keep living. So I was in a race against time as I saw it, to find out what causes aging. And I was pretty convinced then and now that it's programmed. Um, so I did that. I finished that degree. Can I, can I, let, me, let me interrupt you for a second. And so you came to the realization that it's, that it's programmed, meaning, meaning what? That um, we can maybe extend the, uh, you know, our lifespan and our health span, but uh, we're all going to die? Um, you yeah, extend the lifespan and health span, but whether we died or not, it would, the idea was that it would only be by a tragic accident that you could live indefinitely. Mm -hmm. But then, you know, I began to realize that this would be a crazy thing. It wouldn't be very socially sustainable and the rich would probably benefit first. And I began to be a little bit more socially conscious of what this would mean. But my postdoc in Montreal didn't go well. I had a bully boss and they didn't have much recombinant DNA equipment. And I saw senior academics losing their jobs because their funding didn't go through. Yeah. And they had mortgages and kids and I got disillusioned with academia. So I ski bum for a year in Banff, Canada. Um, beautiful, beautiful place. Oh, heaven. Heaven. Lake Lake Louise, Banff, oh my, yeah. Nordic, good places. Yeah, <laughs> some of the happiest days of, of memories of my life. But then I drifted down to San Francisco where I had a cousin and got into accidentally into political activism. Um, that really opened my eyes. So after a 
a period there I came back to Australia and did a master's in nutrition and dietetics. I decided I needed a new career. Right. And so, and that's kind of what your career is today, right? Yeah. I, I'm a dietitian. Um, I've worked in health promotion, community development and local government for quite a while. But since COVID began, I've been full-time private practice and running retreats, lifestyle medicine retreats with a couple of colleagues, which are amazing fun. I know you do them. Yeah. And uh, they're, they're intense and a lot of work, but they're really gratifying. So and gratifying. They're, yeah. And they're so life-changing to see people's changes within seven days. Um, and we've done workplace health programs as well, which is also amazing to do. Hmm. Hmm. And those are, those are a lot less hands-on, but you can get enormous changes as well. Yeah. <clears throat> It seems to me, I've known several New Zealanders over, over my life, and it seems that every one of them has this wanderlust to get out of New yeah. Zealand and travel the world. So is that basically what you did with Can Canada and Banff and San Francisco, or did you yeah. do more than just that? And haven't you noticed they're all good-looking and intelligent? It's a crazy. <laughs> Truly. Really. Um, <laughs> yeah, it is. I think growing up there, it's paradise and it's stunningly beautiful, but it feels like the end of the earth and like you're missing out on the bigger world. Yeah. Because it really is tucked away, sort of out of the way, and it's a long way to anywhere. I mean, it's a three-hour hop over to Australia, but it's still pretty isolated. So mm. Kiwis have this really strong compulsion to get out and see the world. Yeah. And yeah. there's a lot of travelers and there's about a million of them who, like me who didn't come back. Hmm. Like actually, we're going back to New Zealand tomorrow for a month for a holiday. So, because I haven't been back since COVID. Um, wow. Are your parents still alive? My father passed away in 91, sadly, of a, a brain hemorrhage at 71. Hmm. Um, my mother's still alive, but she's in Australia now. She lives nearby hmm. and she's turning 88 this year and is doing great. Right. Do you have any brothers or sisters? Yeah, sisters in Melbourne, brothers in London. So all of us have fled New Zealand. So <laughs> I've got lots of cousins and friends in New Zealand who I'll be checking up on and visiting and hanging out with when we go back. Got it. Got it. Uh, in, in reviewing and looking at your bio, uh, I love seeing that you're a avid yoga practitioner. How often do you practice yoga? Three times a week. Is mm. if I can, um, and yoga one day, gym the next. So I, I pump weights, even though it doesn't show. But I've, I'm, I'm, I think I'm destined to be tall and weedy. But yeah, um, yeah, I love yoga. I've done yoga for decades. I started at uni in Christchurch, probably in New Zealand in the mid '80s, early '80s. And I've I've had some gaps, but I've done it solidly for ten years now, three days a week at least. Right. And I'm, I love that I'm 65 and I can still do handstands. Wow. You're 65. Have, That's incredible. Yeah. And we have like workshops the other weekend. We did an hour and a half of handstands and drills. And I can, I'm the oldest in the class by decades. So can you walk on your hands? Not yet. I'm working on it. Okay. <laughs> All right. We'll work, can on you? we'll work on that together. Uh, I can, but not for more than, you know, eight seconds. Well, you were a professional athlete. Oh, well, I mean, but <laughs> walking on your hands is a completely different animal. It is, I know. And, and then you also, are you still competing in speed windsurfing? That's yes, I am. Yeah. Wow. That is intense. It's, <laughs> it's crazy. Yeah, you're going out in gale force winds in the rare places where you can get flat water and high wind. So that usually means behind a sandbar or, it's, you know, a freakishly flat lake and south australia that stays flat even when it's windy mm. and so we're doing like 80 kilometers an hour which i think is 50 miles per hour oh, yeah. um on these tiny little boards like an ironing board and fully powered up it's it's an equal mixture of fear and adrenaline and, wow. and excitement and then you so you're doing a water start you're getting harnessed in and then you're just taking off yeah, yeah. gosh incredible how long have you been doing that sport Ah, oh, since 79, I bought my first board in New Zealand. I had a long gap when I was traveling and poor and as a student. Um, but I did a lot for the six years or so when it, after I started. Then I, I've been back into it heavily for 20 years. 
Well, that that's kind of a sport that our our family, the Esselstyn family, my my brothers and my sister and my parents, we got into for maybe a good a good three four years, and that's what we would do for vacations. We'd go to different places and we'd we'd windsurf. <laughs> Quite it's it's ex, it's expensive though, and you've got to lug a lot of gear around, and you yeah. need different sails and different boards for different winds, and yeah. it's not a user friendly sport. And young people are switching to kite surfing or foiling, wing sailing. Yeah, yeah. Um, all right, great. So let's get into let's get into the weeds here. Okay, I want to get I want to get serious with you because you know you've got some some pretty big aspirations here for us as a society. And first you say that we are in big trouble. We are in big trouble. Um, you want to talk about that and what you kind of mean by that? Yeah, well, we're an ecological overshoot and I'm very indebted to the work of Professor Bill Rees from Canada who developed the concept of the ecological footprint, but we're, overusing all the key world's resources and we're our society is utterly dependent in every aspect on fossil fuels which are a finite resource they're a one-off carbon pulse once they're gone they're gone and we're not building renewables yet with renewables we're still using fossil fuel to build solar panels and wind towers and etc um, it's estimated that every calorie of food we eat takes 10 to 20 calories of fossil fuel to mm. produce to get it to you so that's the growing the transporting the refrigeration etc it's it's wildly unsustainable all the biodiversity is collapsing through taking their land for you know vast agricultural farms we're seeing a collapse of insect populations we're losing topsoil we're pumping out groundwater faster than it's replacing. There's just multiple pressure points on our ecosystems globally. We're overfishing the oceans. The climate change is just one aspect of multiple problems. Um, yeah, yeah. It's it's a symptom of overshoot. Yeah. It's, it's definitely a big problem, but there's a whole host of other problems that yeah. are bearing down upon us. Yeah, you, you actually... You, um, you, you refer to it as a multiple interrelated diabolical crises. Yes. You know, kind of, uh, you know, all, all hitting us at once. Yeah. Um, and each, each one of them would be an enormous challenge to address. And yet we've, we might have, there's probably 15 or 16 different of these diabolical crises facing us. Yeah, at least. Let, 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 me, <clears throat> let me ask you this. What is the health of, uh, of Australia like? Uh, does it closely mimic the health of uh, uh, America? Or I should say not health, but <clears throat> the sickness as far as the obesity, the diabetes and all that stuff. Yes, we're very close behind. We're not quite as bad as the U.S. I was traveling to the U.S. frequently before COVID for conferences, etc. Where I've met your mother and father, by the way. Oh, Delightful great. people. Yeah. And done workshops with them. Um, Australia's not far behind. We've got 70 plus percent are overweight or obese. Most working age adults have multiple risk factors for chronic disease. Self reported in the last census, around half of Australians report having one or more chronic diseases. Mm -hmm. um, many of them will be pre diabetic and not realize what risk they're in. Um, many will have <clears throat> significant vascular damage and be you know, ticking time bombs for heart attacks or cancer. So we're in, an incredibly sick society. Yeah. Um, is, is it, my understanding is that Australia is becoming pretty, um, pretty pro vegan plant-based. Is that your sentiment as well? Are you seeing that? Yeah, it's growing very fast, mm -hmm. very fast. And every time there's a new documentary we, we get a wave of more people embracing it, checking it out. Um, okay. People are much more open to it. Every family has a vegan with one of the kids or grandkids or cousin or brother. <clears throat> um, like the new series on Netflix, You Are What You Eat, yeah. has led to a wave of people wanting to join our Whole Food Plant-Based Aussies Facebook group. Oh, great. 
So a lot, like hundreds. Yeah. I, I, I saw a graph, I think it was on plant-based news, Instagram channel yesterday. And it showed that I think just last year in the UK, a million more people now identify as vegan, which now ha is now well over, I think it's 3 million people in the UK. Um, and I don't know what the population is of the UK off the top of my head, but what's Australia? Are you guys at about 25 million? I think it's 26 now. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and it's been growing fast. Like we've been taking in half a million immigrants a year since COVID. Um, right. There's creating a little bit of infrastructure pressure, housing shortages. So there's some pushback, but yeah, right. it, it's a big country, but unlike the U S most of it's not fertile or livable. Right. Let's, let's get back to talking about some of these diabolical crises that are kind of uh, all going on right here at the same time. You, you talk about biodiversity loss. And one of the things that I found interesting in reviewing your presentation on this is that 10,000 years ago, we had basically 99% of wild mammals existed on the planet and humans accounted for just 1%, right? And that's flip-flopped, right? Since yeah. then. Um, and you say that this is basically going to lead us, you know, we are in the sixth mass extinction. What does that mean exactly? We are in the sixth mass extinction. Well, there have been previous mass extinctions for different reasons, like dramatic climate change, asteroids, large volcanic explosions, eruptions. This one is anthropogenic, meaning it's caused by humans. And right. we are competitively displacing wild species through taking over the land, through vast monoculture, through use of pesticides and other poisons and sprays. Um, clear harvesting the oceans with, you know, drag nets, yeah. overfishing, clearing all the trees, the forests are being cut back and reduced massively. So there's just loss of habitat and apex predators are being killed wherever there are farmers who don't want them to take their animals, you know, so the, the wolves and the lions, et cetera, are taken out, they're killed. It's, it's just a, a collapse of species on multiple levels yeah and of that the insects are collapsing about eight times faster than vertebrates but the the ripple effect of that is the lizards and the birds and the creatures that eat the insects are also facing food shortages and they'll face population de declines and collapses potentially well you 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 mentioned how we could have a a world without insects within a century and explain exactly why that is such a, a, a travesty. What does that mean for humanity and, 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 and life on earth? Well, the first thing most people would think of is we need pollinators. About 70% of our food supply relies on pollinators, which are insects, mm -hmm. bees, etc. And if they go, then we will have enormous trouble feeding ourselves. We will, we will anyway, for other reasons that we can discuss, but, Pesticide use is now considered the main cause of insect population decline. Um, we're also eliminating the habitat that they live and breed in, like shrubs and trees that were more prevalent in forests, but also mm. climate change is causing stress and decline in species. Um, I've seen data in North America about the massive decline in monarch, monarch butterflies. Yeah. We have a, a parallel here with these things called bogong moths. Now, 30 years ago, when I was in Canberra doing my PhD, I remember in season, you'd see clouds of these moths floating around, like thousands, millions and millions and millions of them. And if you were driving, your windscreen would be covered in bugs. Mm -hmm. Any time of year, there'd be enough bugs that would, you'd have to stop and clean your screen and your light headlights at dusk, you know, at a petrol station every hour or two. Now that doesn't happen. These, the bogong moths are massively declined and there's a lot of species that rely on those mm. creatures for their food. Yeah, I, I just find it to be, it makes my stomach sink, right? Mm. Thinking, thinking about that and how the, diver, the, the diversity of the 
you know, um, all the insects, all the animals, all living things. And when you remove, you know, when one fell swath, one part of it, uh, you're taking, taking the legs out from, you know, um, an important part of what makes us tick as a great. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, what about deforestation? You know, we know deforestation is, is absolutely running rampant in the Amazon. Do you have deforestation in Australia? Enormous, sadly. Yeah. And it's, it's clearing scrublands with trees for more cattle grazing mainly. Um, a lot of land clearing still happening, especially in the north. Um, the state I live in, they've only just stopped native forest logging. In, yeah. It's stopping in the next year or two. And this is old growth forests that are, you know, hundreds of years old and complex, amazing ecosystems. It's unthinkable that they're still considered okay to log that stuff when we have a lot of plantation timber available. Mm. You know, this is there's a lot of political lobbying to that's enabled this to continue, but it's it's really um, criminal what they're doing. But the, you mentioned the Amazon, like the tropical forest tree loss is still enormous. And I, I'm so glad there's been a change of government in Brazil, but the Amazon apparently is now a net carbon emitter rather than net carbon sequesterer. Mm. And it's reaching a tipping point where it could burn completely like we had rainforests in Australia burn in the large bushfires of 2019, 2020, over that horrendous summer. Oh yeah. And much of Australia was on fire. And those rainforests have never burnt in, in any known history. You know, they're not supposed to burn. They're rainforests, they're supposed to be too moist. Mm -hmm. So the Amazon is drying out gradually as it's getting the, its margins nibbled at and, and it, the planet's heating. Um, the Amazon's so big it has its own weather, but this is going to change. It will, it will burn and it will turn into savanna probably unless we do some dramatic changes and start to protect it. Yeah. And in yeah. many ways, it's the lungs of the planet. You know, mm -hmm. these forests really are so vital for biodiversity and the ecosystem and the climate. Yeah. Well, it's like, it's like Dr. Seuss's The Lorax. It's like... Uh, how can we not, how can we not see what we're doing to, to ourselves and to this precious planet that we live on? And how do we continue to allow this, um, <clears throat> egregious behavior? It, it's just, it's, it's, it's mind, it's mind numbing to me. Yeah. It's like the tragedy of the commons, you know, yeah. each individual person or business is pursuing their own interests without looking at the bigger picture. And I think I think we have, my partner's a trauma therapist and she deals with sociopaths and psychopaths and narcissists. And they, from what I know, these people tend to rise to positions of power or end up in prison. And yeah. so, you know, corporate leaders, military leaders, often can be sociopathic, which means they have no guilt or shame and they're ruthless. And I think these people often rise to positions of power where they they pursue their own interests and greed without regard for other people or other creatures or the environment. I think it takes a a certain personality to r recklessly endanger our home in this mm -hmm. way. I, I think there's also an ignorance. We It's easy to feel like the earth is vast and resilient and right. it can take whatever we you know, throw it up with a chainsaw or axe or fire, but there's too many of us. Mm -hmm. we, it's just, it's, it, it's not able to withstand the multiple assaults on its ecosystems globally. And we're seeing the, the result of that. We've, we've, passed, we've passed six of the nine planetary boundaries. You know, we're, we're overtaxing the earth in almost every aspect. So you said, so, <laughs> you said something that I don't know if I've ever heard before. Six of we we've overpassed six of the nine planetary boundaries. Um, what are those boundaries? Actually, I can't recite them all, but there's like the 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 amount of uh, 
I don't have this in my slide set because I don't usually refer to that, but it's yeah, it's yeah. a concept um, that there's it's key. The scientists worked out there are key areas that we have a finite amount of Earth's resources we can use, and we've and there are nine of those areas, and we've we've over overreached six of those nine. Right. Right. Well. And in your presentation, <clears throat> in your presentation, you know, you, you mentioned how, <clears throat> excuse me, um, you know, we're approaching, we're, we're going to be approaching 10 billion people on the planet here within the next, you know, couple decades. That in and of itself, I would imagine, is going to be surpassing one of those. <laughs> those yes, correct. And, and so many of the experts who look at this closely, the ecological economists, um, estimate that perhaps the carrying capacity of us humans is maybe one to two billion for the planet to live harmoniously with the Earth's ecosystems. And, and we're at eight billion now as of late last year, and predicted yeah. to go to 10 billion before we plateau. Now. Now, the footprint of those people, especially as they move towards a high consumption Western lifestyle, is just going to be way more than the planet can sustain. We're already overreaching the planet's resources every year. Um, so the, the, the footprint on the planet, it's already, we live like we have 1.7 planets. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, so we're, we're, we're digging down into the resources faster than they can renew. Yeah. Do you, when you said we're going to, you know, reach 10 billion and then plateau, do you know why is it that we plateau at 10 billion? Birth rates are declining globally, especially in the more developed wealthy countries. In fact, they're, they're below replacement rate. Um, the lowest, I think, is South Korea, which is about 1.1 babies per couple. Mm -hmm. um, all the developed Western countries and China are uh, populating at below the replacement rate. There's big population growth in the very poor countries, like particularly Africa, and that's traditionally been an economic um, and education and a, uh, a matter of availability of birth control, fertility control, etc. Mm -hmm. um, but those countries are also predicted to plateau in future as the women get more control over their own fertility. With, well. Um, yeah. contraception etc yeah well that all sounds very <clears throat> as, as far as doing the right thing for mother earth because we're so ob overpopulated that sounds like the smart a smart solution right have have less children or don't have any children be ch child free and, and adopt absolutely i mean in in some ways our own um stupidity is is helping us because the fertility rate of humans is also dropping steadily mm -hmm. at several percent per year and this is environmental pollutants poor health right. so you, couples around the world are having more trouble having babies because they're just not healthy and they've got too many environmental contaminants pollutants mm -hmm. it's not quite clear what the problem is but we we're not able to produce enough babies in many countries mm -hmm. um so that's yeah. actually a good thing in my mind. It's sad for the couples who want a child, but absolutely, yeah, yeah. What What about you? You mentioned in your presentation the collapse of fisheries. Um, can you elaborate on that a, a little bit? Yeah, there are multiple factors happening there. We're we're essentially overfishing. Where most of the world's fisheries are in collapse through overfishing. Um, and, and experts will argue that where any fishing is overfishing at the moment, it, the oceans are in such dire state. Yeah. And, and anyone who's seen that amazing documentary, Sea Spiracy, will get a deep dive into this. I'd highly recommend that. Um, we waste a lot of fish. Up to a third of fish is wasted before reaching the plate. A lot of fish are dumped or they're fed to fish farms which is like a food factory in reverse you know so you give 10 kilos of fish meal to get one kilo of of farmed salmon for example but fish growth is being slowed by increasing ocean temperatures and plastic chemical pollution like bpa um, 
Yeah. We're also decimating populations of seabirds, of whales and dolphins, of turtles, seals. We're clear fishing sharks, you know, so through the whole, whole ocean food chain, we're stressing it and overtaxing it. Um, yeah, we need, to, we need to stop fishing. We are successfully doing everything in our power to not live in harmony with the other creatures that we inhabit this planet. It, it, it's, it's, it's sinful. It's, it, it's sinful. It's despicable. And hearing you talk, it, um, it just makes me disgusted with us as a, as a race. Me too, and it's heartbreaking. Um, and I don't think they're all bad people involved in these industries. I just think they don't know what they don't know. And many of them are poor people who need to make a living and feed their children. It's just that people are not taught about what we're doing and provided with alternatives. Like for most people around the world, they still have to do a job they don't really like, get up every morning and bring home money for their mortgage or their rent and their kids and many times that will be a job which is environmentally destructive but if people don't have the education and the opportunity they don't have a choice mm -hmm. you know so I, I don't it's the leaders at the top who know this and are not doing anything that i really have anger for i mean anger is not really a healthy emotion but the, they're the ones driving this it's the, the captains of industry who yeah. are, we were educated enough to have a sense of what we're doing. But as I said, many of them will be sociopathic. You know, they'll have children and grandchildren and they won't be even factoring that in. Let, could you let the audience know about the inefficiency of animal agriculture? Um, you have some stats in your, in, your, in your deck that I think are pretty darn powerful. And I can, I can jog your memory if you, uh, if you sure. want. Yeah. No, no, I, I know this stuff from oh, okay, yeah. delivering this talk so often. Um, yeah. the, best, the best estimate was from an amazing study from Oxford University in England in, in um, 2018 by academics Poor and Nemesic. And they surveyed over 90% of the world's food production from a bottom-up data collection point where they got food data from almost all of the world. Yeah. And what they found was that Animal agriculture is using 83% of all the world's farmland, but it produces only 18, 18% of our calories and about a third of our protein. Mm. That is wildly inefficient, wildly inefficient. What that means is if we stopped farming animals yeah. and we let animals go wild again and, and didn't have feral animals, you know, cows and sheep don't belong in Australia. Chickens are not from Australia. They shouldn't be here at all. Right. They're terrible for the soil and ecosystems. So if we stopped animal agriculture, we could put 76% of all the world's farmland back to wilderness. How powerful would that be? That's amazing. We have the solution at our fingertips, which right. would take our foot off the throat <laughs> of this precious planet within a year or two. If, if these animals would die out or we'd feed the remaining livestock to those who wanted their last bit of animal-based meat and and this would be an enormous reprieve for the planet enormous enormous and so absolutely necessary well, uh, yeah. yeah yeah and we won't we won't make one and a half degrees or let alone two unless we change animal egg unless we get rid of it we have to change the way we produce food because so, this is yeah. it's such a big contributor to global warming amongst yeah. other things yeah so can you just very very quickly mentioned it but i think it probably went over a lot of people's heads you mentioned 1.5 to 2 degrees why can you explain the importance of those numbers well they're considered to be points we shouldn't go past it's dangerous to get warmer than one or half one and a half or two degrees and celsius. most of the science sorry celsius yeah celsius. most of the scientists i know are listening to and reading are saying we've it's too late for one and a half degrees, but we'll, we'll race past two degrees Celsius warming if we don't change how we produce food. We must change the food system in order to have any hope of not having runaway warming and, and reaching dangerous tipping points like losing all the world's polar ice, 
um, melting the methane permafrost regions, which release enormous amounts of methane, multiple tipping points. We, the ocean currents could stop or change direction. Right. The oceans will get too warm. You know, there's, there's multiple scary potential tipping points that we might pass um, if we don't keep temperatures beneath these agreed limits. And yeah. the scientists say there's no hope of doing that without massively reducing animal ag. Yeah. Um, talk to me for a sec about a antibiotic resistance and why that is, <clears throat> um, what exactly that is and why that it's important that we get that in check. Yeah, this one particularly terrifies me. Um, we're squandering our precious antibiotics globally by overusing them in animal ag. So they're, they're administered prophylactically to factory farmed animals in particular. So it's thought, it's estimated that about 80% of the world's antibiotic use is for farming for animals. Now, what the, this means is that because the concentration of those farmed animals in feedlot farming especially so this is cattle in the US and more and more around the world pigs and chickens particularly are farmed intensively in these intensive feedlots so those are stressed animals they get more sick so they give them antibiotics prophylactically to keep them well but it also coincidentally makes them grow faster so there's an economic driver to this but it, what it means is the bacteria are being given more of a chance to develop resistance against those antibiotics. And so one by one, those antibiotics are becoming useless because if they're administered to someone with an infection, they don't work anymore. Mm. We're more and more seeing people get infected with antibiotic resistant bacteria. We're approaching a pre-antibiotic era again. What that means is if you get a bad infection in your leg, yeah. amputation is the only option it means that hip replacements are off the table cesarean births are off the table these will be too risky you cannot do these without antibiotics mm. so for most people if they get a bad infection it'll be removal of that area of the body that limb etc or they die so, yeah so uh, according to the research that you've seen how long do you think we we potentially are going to be in that era um, well, it depends on how fast we can find new antibiotics and st also stop wasting them through overexposing them to bacteria in factory farming. Mm -hmm. So the, the bacteria mu mutate and, and adapt very quickly because they have 50 life cycles in a day mostly. And so they can change genetically. They can learn to live with these antibiotics. So we're in a race against time. and it seems like there are not the incentives globally to produce enough new antibiotics and they're very hard to find and develop. Mm. And so if we squander the ones we have, our current arsenal that keep us safe and allow these operations and allow us not to have amputations through infection, then we're in deep trouble. Yeah. You know, deep. so deep trouble. Um. Talk to me about food security um, and about how, you know, you talk about how the soil that we have, it took 500 years to develop this healthy topsoil. Um, and we're effectively, <laughs> of course, we're, we're, we're blowing that as well. Yes. Well, industrial farming is leading to a net loss of topsoil every, every growing season because we're not farming regeneratively, we're not farming organically, we're clearing vast areas of land and the dust will blow away, the topsoil will run away in streams and rivers. And so, like many of the world's resources, we're depleting the topsoil faster than it can regenerate. And it can take 500 years to develop a, another centimeter of topsoil. Yeah. And, and the, the thin layer of soil around the globe is the what keeps us alive otherwise we're living on a rock and we can't grow food and grass won't grow it becomes desert in and infertile and and not viable for for producing any food so 
we need to shift how we do agriculture so that we we build the soil with every growing season this means regenerative organic agriculture where the soil is alive and full of microbiome and the, the vast you know populations of microbes that live in the soil and keep us healthy keep the plants healthy modern industrial agriculture is spraying poisons on the soil continuously and it's it's not really correctly no shouldn't be called soil it's more just dirt mm -hmm. and we keep those plants alive with with um, petrochemical fertilizers and sprays so we need to rethink the way we do agriculture and places like the Rodale Institute in, in the US are doing amazing work but permaculture is also incredible that was developed out of Australia mm. and we practice permaculture in our section here in Melbourne um, my partner is trained in it did an intensive 12 month course so th this is the way forward we need to think about farming sustainably in a way that regenerates the soil and the nice bonus is that that will sequester carbon from the from the atmosphere yeah yeah because you've got a higher level of organic matter in the soil what's what's the actual cost right now for us eating animals you, you say how we pay for cheap animal food three times what are those three times well we pay at the cash register when we pick up a, a slab of dead animal um, we we also pay in subsidies to animal agriculture industries and and thirdly we pay in in the externalities that animal agriculture creates with um, health and environmental costs and damage so you know Peter all this is pretty darn it's pretty darn dark and uh, and, and frankly uh, a wee bit, or I should say, a huge bit depressing. So, what, what can, what can I do? Like, what can every one of the listeners to the Plant Strong podcast? What can they do starting tomorrow to help basically mitigate and do do each each and every one of us do our part to try and turn this thing around? It's a great question, and I agree. This is quite depressing. Um, you can start this before tomorrow. You can start with your next meal, your next snack, by not eating animal food. Pack up the animal food in your house and give it to someone you don't like. Okay. Because it will harm, it will harm their health. But don't eat it and don't buy any more. If you eat plants, that's the single biggest thing most people can do, unless you're a very frequent flyer. Yeah. Um, it's enormous the contribution of not eating animal food. It vastly helps the world's environment so that's it it's it's exciting that we have the power in our own hands and our knife and fork every yeah. single one of us to make an enormous difference to the future of this beautiful planet and the species that we share it with who are on their last legs many of them um, so that's the really exciting thing um, I would also say learn to grow your own food Mm. especially if you live in a city because cities cannot feed themselves they rely on a river of trucks every night and it's said that we're around around nine meals away from anarchy what does that mean exactly How, what, what does that mean if to you nine meals is three days if we run out of food for three days people get hungry they'll start to riot mm. they'll mm. start to knock on their neighbors doors and and ask or steal food Right. people don't like to be hungry if they're hungry too much they'll move like locusts and look for food and many people will do what it takes to get food it will lead to conflict and war so learning to grow food is important so join a local local gardening group a permission culture group um, learn to swap food with your neighbors make friends with your neighbors your neighbor might have a good crop of potatoes and you might have a good crop of tomatoes and you can swap yeah yeah. Or you, you call them tomatoes, but anyway, so there's a lot you can do in that regard. And knowing your neighbors means you trust each other. So you're more likely to share and collaborate when times are hard rather than be looking to sneak over the fence and steal their food from the garden. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> what about uh, what do you have any? Um, you mentioned earlier in our conversation about um, being being supportive of, I think, regenerative, regenerative agriculture 
and organic. absolutely. So you're you're a fan of organic and regenerative, right? A huge fan. Organic is probably better for our health from from what the science shows. Mm -hmm. But the strongest reason I I recommend organic is because it's better for the environment. The, as I said, the pesticides are killing the soil. They're the leading cause of insect population collapse. We need those insects. The earth will do fine without humans, but we won't last long without insects. Yeah. And and so organic is a better choice. It and right. if you know the farmer, you you're with a local um, community supported agriculture, and you're supporting that farmer by providing them with income, and you know that they're farming regeneratively, then you're you're voting with your dollars to support agriculture that's helping the planet rather than harming the planet. What about reducing food waste? How do you recommend we start that? Because I know that that um, food waste is 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 out of control. It's terrible. We waste over a third of all the food grown, and a lot of it's at the household level. Yeah. I was talking to a patient this week, saying, "Oh, I buy lots of fruit, but then I notice it's rotting, and I have to throw it out." Yeah. And I said, "Well, you know, we're about to go away tomorrow. We've got about ten ripe bananas because we have a smoothie every day for dessert. So, I oh, will skin and freeze them." Yeah. And they'll be good to go when we get home in a month. And so you can cook the fruit up when it's ripe. You know, you can keep an eye on it to make sure it doesn't go off. You can buy what you need and you can plan times where you cook food before it gets too old. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's a whole lot of ways to reduce waste. And what about, uh, so you, what are you going to do with those 10 banana peels that you've turned into... Um, you know, turned into, you know, frozen bananas for your smoothies. Are those banana peels going to go into an or, a organic compost bin? Of course. We I have hope. Four, we have four huge organic compost bins in our garden here. I don't know if you can see outside. With oh, that's the great. I love fruit. seeing that, Peter. Way fruit to be. Trees. <laughs> yeah. Walking the walk, my man. I love it. Most people don't realize you can actually eat banana skins if you wash them. Um, yeah. They're quite edible. There are recipes out there for cakes made with the whole banana. You clip the top and tail off yeah. and take the, take the little sticker off, blend yeah. it up, and you can <laughs> put that in the cake. So I think if times, times get hard, we won't be composting them. We'll be eating them. Well, you know, Carly Bodrug of Plant You, she actually turns banana peels into banana bacon. <laughs> yes, I've, I've heard that. Yeah, yeah. 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 So, yeah, yeah compost it. Yeah. I was talking to my brother the other day and he was telling me that I can't remember what, what war it was. It might, it might've been the civil war, but, um, these, these men in the wintertime got so hungry and they were so low on food. They were eating their leather belts. Yeah. I mean, imagine yeah. that, imagine that. Um, what you have an acronym called let's what, what exactly does that stand for? It's a local exchange trading system. So this is like ah. a green dollar local economy. So it means that you might have a skill like you can alter clothing or you can cut hair or you can mine someone's pet. And I was in one of these when we lived further north years ago and they were fabulous. So um, mm. what it means is that you trade your skills and no money changes hands. So you get an agreed credit for say an hour of of um, trimming, um, um, fixing clothing, you know, patching up socks or adjusting trousers. And in that return for that, that credit, you can then purchase something like a haircut or someone gives you a lift. Mm. Um, and so it's not taxed and governments don't usually tax this, but it means you've got a local sustaining economy where you're supporting each other with the different skill sets you have. But this is a, a beautiful way to build community and have a more sustainable and sharing economy where there's less waste. Yeah. So speaking of less waste, are you a big fan of people downsizing and, uh, and, and less is more? Absolutely. Yeah. We have to live more simply. I'm a huge fan of um, a guy, Nate Hagens, who's one of your compatriots. He's in Minnesota. I think he's, oh. he's got a really good podcast. I, I love his work, but um, he's, he says we need to live much more simply. Because everything, everything in, in our worlds is dependent on fossil fuel to, to dig up, to grow, to transport, to 
manufacturer to deliver we're not going to have that luxury we're going to get have to get used to less energy driving our society and that means building things to last fixing them repairing them sharing them not consuming as much living to learning to live with less and more simply yeah. and using our neighborhood and our community to support each other yeah and, and in return to me by downsizing by getting rid of all of the trappings uh societal trappings and things that we think we need you actually a light bulb go goes on and to me you become happier instead of you know instead of searching for something this elusive thing that you just can't ever catch on to thinking that oh I, if i could just have this and i could have this and i could have this yeah it's and the capitalist economy en encourages that continuous consumerism because that's what drives the economy yeah and if we're not growing then it's considered a bad thing it's no. it's said i don't know if you've heard the saying but we we in the modern world we're encouraged to spend money we don't have to buy things we don't need to impress people we don't like <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness great can you say that one more time if you can remember it we're encouraged to spend money we don't have yeah to buy things we don't need to impress people we don't like <sighs> and that's the state of the modern world it's very sad yeah truly and we is. end up with cluttered houses and when it's hard rubbish day every year you see households with all this crap on the front lawn for the council to pick up things that have built an obsolescence that don't last long that break after six months and they end up in the rubbish and go to landfill mm -hmm. and it's this mindless consumerism mm -hmm. when i was a kid we had woolen socks that were handmade and we've repaired them when the toe went out right we 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 fixed trousers you know we repaired clothing because it was expensive then it wasn't made with cheap or slave labor in third world countries mm -hmm. it was made in new zealand locally and it cost a fair bit so we looked after those things and we repaired them and made them last and when you outgrew them they were handed down to your younger sibling mm -hmm. this doesn't happen today no not to the extent that it should not even close what's the darwin app i th i think you're a fan of the darwin app yeah i heard this guy on a podcast um, that one of my friends runs and he's actually the grandson of Charles Darwin oh, wow. the theory of evolution he lives in Australia now and he he's passionate about us eating less animal food and the environment and he he created this app that you can get for free on your phone so if you look for Darwin challenge and it, it calculates the environmental impact of every animal food free meal you have in terms of how much longer you'll live how many cars it will take off the road how many fish chickens it'll save how many people it will take out of chronic malnutrition how much water it saves how much land it saves how much forest it saves it's brilliant they did a lot of research to make this accurate yeah to make sure that the calculations are there so this can be really motivating to people for people to look at and see how much change they're leading to with their food choices mm um i'd love for you to finish up by talking about some industry initiatives that are going on right now that um that are hopeful and and give you hope yeah i, I like this aspect this is not food that i will be buying because it's replica animal food you know and this is happening already with things like beyond beef and impossible burgers i've never had them and i don't plan to because i don't like meat I don't want a meat replica that looks and tastes like meat. And these are not really health foods. Are you, are you, are you calling that a replica or replicant? Oh, it doesn't matter. They're fake. Okay. You know, they're, 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 meant to, they're meant to appeal to meat eaters and they're the key audience. I think the, the business people who are making these are smart. They know vegans are not their key market. But if this is, this is exciting because uh, organizations like Rethink X, which is San Francisco-based think tank, for example, they're forecasting that the rise of these alternatives that don't require the animal that can be produced in a lab or a factory is so fast and there's so many billions of dollars going into this globally that by the end of this decade it will essentially make animal agriculture obsolete yeah and if not stranded assets these will be cheaper they'll be better they'll be safer you won't get food poisoning from them 
They won't have salmonella or listeria or campylobacter like so many of the animal products. There won't be people dying from poor quality mincemeat. So the, the, the people who love animal foods can still eat them and they won't know the difference and it will be better and cheaper and safer. And so this is going to put the animal egg out of business. Mm. They're not viable. They'll be stranded assets and so bankrupt. So the, the farmers will need to be supported. We need government programs to help those people transition, to train them, hopefully to rewild that farmland, yeah. to, to help new species come in, plants and animals, and to help give the earth a massive breather. But th these things excite me, even though I'll never buy them, because they're going to put animal ag out of business, whether we all turn vegan or not. Mm -hmm. Well, then, and, and to your point, I mean, as, as much as we all want the human race to be healthy, I think the most important thing right now is we need Mother Earth to be healthy so that we can thrive. And without Mother Earth, <laughs> we're all going down. We're all going, we're all spiraling, down the, spiraling down the drain. Correct. Yeah, there's no healthy people on a dead planet. No, no, no. Um, you know, Peter, um, you've got a really, really great, a great energy. Uh, I, I love your, um, your mission. I, I love the way you have, you know, traveled down your path in life and where it's led you and what you're doing now and all the, all the great work and the people that you're helping. And, um, you know, when you reached out to me not too long ago, uh, I immediately was like, was thinking this was a, uh, this is a guy that I really want to come on the podcast and to share your, your passion for a, a better and a healthier civilization and planet. And, um, you didn't disappoint. You were, you were fantastic. Really appreciate you. Thank you, Rip. And, and uh, I do have an enormous passion to help people have their best life. Yeah. So it's a joy to help people get healthy. But my main driver now is for the environment. Yeah. That's every person I can get to eat more plant food and less animal food or no animal food is a victory for the planet. Yeah. Well, you are um, so eloquent, so well-spoken and uh, love your accent. Love the <laughs> could listen to it all day long. Really good. Um, so what do you got planned for the rest of the day since it's now, you know, 7 a.m. Australian time? <laughs> in half an hour, I've got a, a mentee. So I, I mentor new dietitian graduates. Um, this, yeah, so that I do, I'm doing that for an hour um, via Zoom. Yeah. He, he's in Queensland. Then I've got a patient or two. Um, I've got to finish my packing for New Zealand and sort out a few things. We haven't had a holiday for a while, so... We're excited to be going back to my home country and yeah, touring around, catching up with old friends and cousins and having yeah, some you, beach, some beach time. Good. You got a place to stay while you're there? Yeah, yeah. We're, we're renting a car and we're just cruising around. Um, and I do feel guilty about the fossil fuel and the traveling. And But we live we live incredibly lightly during the year. We've, yeah. we've both been plant-based for over 30 years. We grow lots of our food we regenerate our soil we don't drive much yeah we've got solar panels on our roof solar hot water solar electricity you know yeah. we do as much as we can so yeah good good, of a, good good for you i think that you deserve the trip back to your homeland and a little vacation time yeah um we'll take in some of the fresh air and the ocean ocean breeze for for all of us that can't be there Thanks, Rip. And it was a, a, a delight to meet with you. Thank you. I've enjoyed your, enjoyed your channel for a long time. Good. Well, thank you, Peter. And it was great having you on. Can you, can you hit me with a virtual plant strong fist bump on the way out? Boom. <laughs> Go get him, Peter. <laughs> thank you. All right. Over and out, mate. <laughs> Take care. Dr. Johnson has given me permission to share his slide presentation in our show notes with all of you so that you have the facts and the science behind this environmental crisis that we face. As Maya Angelou has said, 
When you know better, you do better. It's my hope that after listening to this podcast, you know a little bit more and are empowered to make changes that have big consequences. Thanks so much for listening. And as always, let's keep you and Mother Earth plant strong. I'll see you next week. The Plant Strong podcast team includes Carrie Barrett, Lori Kordowich, and Amy Mackey. If you like what you hear, do us a favor and share the show with your friends and loved ones. You can always leave a five-star rating and review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. And while you're there, make sure to hit that follow button so that you never miss an episode. As always, this and every episode is dedicated to my parents, Dr. Caldwell B. Esselstyn Jr. and Anne Cryo Esselstyn. Thanks so much for listening.